looks yeah. great. Good. Okay, so uh, I'm on. You are. Yep. Go ahead, please. Oh, very good. Well, thanks to everyone who's here for hanging around until the uh, very end of uh, a long but very interesting and productive day. Uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon about um, randomization. In particular, um, randomization is something that we all know in clinical trials. Everybody pays lip service. Yes, we should randomize the patients. And it's very rare in my experience that people worry about it more than that or think about what's involved. But what I hope to tell you in the next uh, 18 or so minutes is um, about uh, some of the um, issues involved in randomization in complex clinical trials. And I'm going to acquaint you with a method that you may not have heard of before, but um, it's very useful and it should be more widely known than it is. Okay. Um, first, uh, a couple of quick words about the need for efficient randomization. Um, the figure on my top line is a bit out of date. I think I got it about four or five years ago, but at that time, the top 50 life sciences companies spent about $100 billion annually on research and development. I'm sure the number's higher now. Um, as we've heard, in fact, even earlier this afternoon, a little while ago, uh, many of you know that the randomized control trial, or RCT, is widely considered to be the gold standard of clinical trials um, because it minimizes bias and allows rigorous probability-based inference comparing the outcomes of different treatments. Um, doing the randomization efficiently increases statistical power, gives you more power for the specified number of students, or looking at it the other way, decreases the number of patients needed um, to achieve a specified power. And so approaching randomization wisely um, can often get um, big improvements in bang for the buck. Okay, so um, randomization uh, minimizes bias, um, as I just noted, uh, minimizes confounding um, if done properly. Uh, it also allows us to conceal the treatment allocation. We don't want the investigators, the patients, the clinical staff, or the evaluators to know who, which of the patients received which treatment. Randomization helps cover that uh, information. And uh, as I again said a minute ago, it permits scientifically valid inference. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon about three basic types of randomization. Uh, complete or simple or unrestricted randomization. Uh, this one is the easiest uh, to understand and implement, but very inefficient because there's a great risk of unbalanced groups. In other words, groups of patients that differ substantially among the treatments in both basic ways, uh, such as gender and age. There could be surprisingly large differences um, based on random variability from one treatment to another and more complex ways. And these um, situations that are unbalanced can make it especially difficult to um, make the comparisons that we would like to make. Um, a um, more complex randomization method involves stratified permuted blocks where we take the patients, divide them into strata, groups that are relatively homogeneous on attributes that are important for the um, clinical study we're doing. Uh, and each block of similar patients is then allocated among the treatments. We take a bunch of very similar patients and um, assign different patients within this group to different treatments. And that blocking makes the um, playing field much more even. The groups that the treatments um, are 
administered to are much more similar than with unrestricted randomization. And last and um, least known is a relatively new approach, uh, dynamic allocation or covariate adjusted randomization. This is valuable particularly when patient blocks can't be formed in advance. Um, uh, we, in order to perform this approach, we need to select relative weights for imbalances. I'll say more about that in a minute. To compare different randomization uh, methods and plans, um, we need to know uh, what our evaluation goals are. Uh, a randomization plan should minimize the imbalance among treatment groups with respect to factors of prognostic importance, with respect to institution in multi-center trials. We don't want one treatment to be administered mostly to people in one medical center and another treatment to be administered largely to patients in another uh, medical center, for example. Um, there are several performance criteria of interest to us. We want to minimize the total, um, total balance, I should say total imbalance of the design. Um, we want to minimize the departure from the desired treatment allocation, how the treatments are um, allocated. Uh, we might want equal numbers of patients for each treatment, or in some cases we might want, for example, twice as many patients for the uh, experimental treatment as for the control treatment. We want to maximize efficiency and again, minimize selection bias and confounding uh, and enable blinding. Okay, so complete randomization, um, we talked about um, a few minutes already. Um, basically, we take each patient and independently randomize that patient among the treatments. The probabilities might be uh, one to one. We might want, as I said a minute ago, uh, equal numbers of patients in, uh, for all treatments, or we might want uh, more patients, say twice as many for one treatment as another. Um, simple to understand and execute and minimizes selection bias and confounding. But the cons that we've uh, mentioned uh, are the risk of imbalance on important factors. And also complete randomization doesn't take advantage of the similarities among patients that we use when we block. So the method I've talked um, a couple of minutes ago about constructing the blocks um, and then allocating treatments within each block. Uh, and this ensures that the treatments uh, are, um, you know, uh, administered to very similar groups of patients. Um, the pros are that we have this nice balance and we have the increased efficiency due to um, the blocking because of the uh, homogeneity within blocks. And this minimizes, or if we're lucky, can even eliminate the departure from the desired treatment ratio. But a big con is that, whoops, that this requires patient information in advance to form the blocks. We need to take a large bunch of patients and break that patient population into blocks of very similar patients. And this gets much more complicated as the number of factors that we block on increases. Okay, okay. so now here's the um, sort of the, the big reveal. I'll be interested in knowing whether many of you um, are aware of this method already. Um, the method of dynamic allocation or covariate adjusted randomization. And the idea here is basically this. I'm not giving you any formulas, but I want to give you the ideas. Every time we have a new patient, like if, for example, if I have the 15th patient in front of me, 
and there are 14 patients who've been recruited to the study, and I'm trying to allocate the 15th most effectively. And once I do that, when the next patient shows up in a few days or a couple of weeks, I'll keep doing the same thing iteratively. So what we want to do whenever a new patient has to be um, incorporated into the study in addition to those we already have, first, we evaluate every possible treatment that we could assign that patient to by calculating its total imbalance. We'll just call it TI. And the basic idea is to assign the patient most intelligently, we want to assign the patient to the treatment that has the minimum total imbalance among all the treatments that are possible. But there's a problem with that, a huge problem. And that is if we do this kind of assignment, it's deterministic, not random. And deterministic assignment puts right out the window our ability to make um, probability statements about um, p-values and effects. So in order to retain validity, we must modify the assignment of each patient to the treatment that gives the best, the lowest total imbalance by including some randomization in the process. And we'll talk now for a few minutes about how to do that. So allowing patients to enter the trial individually is huge as an advantage because there are many trials where we don't have the luxury of having our whole patient population in front of us where in advance where we can form the blocks. And it also adjusts the allocation probabilities to reflect the current state. In other words, to reflect the assignments of patients that we have already made, patients previous to the one we're working on now. The cons are, first, that this is a very complex process to implement and to analyze. Well, it has to be complex because the allocation is complex. And it also requires um, weights for us to um, properly calculate the total uh, imbalance. And we'll talk a little bit about how to um, assign those weights, but not very much. That's sort of a big topic for another talk. Okay. So for each new patient in dynamic allocation, using data from everyone who's been uh, assigned so far, um, this just repeats what I said a minute ago. For the new patient, we see how much imbalance is created by looking at every possible treatment we could assign the patient to. And the treatment imbalance is a linear combination of balances across factors, weight, a weighted sum of four types of components, treatment group, stratum, site, prognostic factors. Um, we want to sort of take account of the imbalance from all of these four sources. And we want to assign the new patient to the treatment with the minimum total imbalance, mostly, but modify this by putting enough randomness into the process to give us validity, which we're going to talk about here. So um, in order to avoid making a deterministic or a nearly deterministic assignment, um, there are several approaches that have been studied, and two that I'm going to tell you about very briefly are uh, what I'll call dynamic allocation one and two. DA1, best and second best. What we're basically going to do is if there are several treatments that share the minimum total imbalance, we're just going to randomize among those. But if there's one treatment that has the minimum total imbalance, then we'll randomize the patient among treatments with that minimum and the second lowest total imbalance. So we'll let that patient stray from the minimum, but not very far. Another approach, dynamic allocation with complete randomization, says with a, uh, with a specified probability, what we will do 
is assign patients to a treatment with the minimum total imbalance um, at random if there are more than one share, treatment sharing the minimum. And with the remaining complementary probability, we'll just assign the patient randomly among all treatments. So we want that latter probability to be large enough to give us validity, but not too large. We want to keep a good, strong likelihood of going with the minimum total imbalance. Okay. Um, statistical analysis for these randomization methods. Well, for complete randomization and the block, stratified permuted block randomization, everything's very simple, intuitive, well understood. These have been widely used for 100 years. Software is available in all our packages that perform basic statistical analysis because these are basic analyses. With dynamic allocation, the analysis is complex. Um, it has to be in order to accommodate the complex randomization procedure. Um, and there's a real danger that I want to flag for you. You might say, well, I've assigned the patients by dynamic allocation, but the analysis is too hard. I'll just run the analysis of, as if it were a permuted block design. Well, if you perform an incorrect analysis, the inferences can be substantially wrong. And that makes sense. If you randomize the patients in a certain way, the analysis has to reflect that fact. Um, I've got uh, an example here um, of... DA1, and I also have an example of DA2, but I don't really have time to go through these. So what I'm going to do is, if you look at the slide, I've, I've written them up in a way that I think makes them easy enough to work through. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes to read through them, as I would do now if I had five more minutes. But the key principle in both of these examples is this, whether we perform dynamic allocation by best and second best or by complete randomization with a relatively small probability, say 10 or 15 or 20 percent, in either case, we have a high enough level of randomization to permit us to make rigorous, scientifically valid conclusions, while at the same time, there's um, a high enough emphasis on reducing the total imbalance um, to increase the accuracy of the statistical calculations on treatment effects and p-values. So I have a few words here about um, the suitability of R for um, performing the uh, dynamic allocation randomization. And uh, I've found uh, two R packages, and I'm sure there are several more that perform uh, dynamic allocation. There's Minirand and Seek a lot. Um, I've also listed down here uh, a few key um, references. Uh, the first two are like the seminal papers of this method from the mid 1970s, um, a paper from about 10 years ago that describes the errors that can pop up if we don't do the analysis correctly. Uh, Rosenberger and um, uh, Lechen is a uh, very good and well-known book on randomization and clinical trials. And the um, uh, Jin Paulus and Hartzell is a relatively recent uh, paper on these methods. So um, this, my next to last slide says that um, the performance of uh, clinical trial designs compared to one another uh, depends on a lot of factors, the number of treatments, the allocation ratios, the number of factors, um, the relative weights of the four types of components in total imbalance, and there's more. So this is a very complex problem. And our um, conclusions are that the performance of randomization designs, the performance is greatly influenced by many aspects of the specific study we're performing. Is performing, is permuted block randomization possible? If the patients arrive one by one and we 
have to administer them, we have to assign them as they come in, the answer is no. When we can do both a permuted block design uh, and a covariate adjusted or dynamic allocation design, when both of these are options, we have to ask how much better does one perform than the other. Uh, for block designs, again, we have to keep in mind how long it takes to accumulate patients to create the blocks. Remember that both of these, block designs and dynamic allocations designs, are not just a design, but each of these is a very wide class of designs on its own. And so my advice is to assess relative performance for the specific study with the um, uh, characteristics of uh, your clinical trial rather than going from general principles. So um, thank you very much. Thanks, yes. Steve. Um, so one question is roughly how much do the um, DA1 and DA2 approaches reduce sample size? Um, that's a great question. And um, I, I don't have a number, but what I will tell you is that um, it is likely to be very substantial. And here's what I mean by that. Um, if we look at block designs, permuted block designs versus completely randomized designs, um, permuted block designs will often um, reduce the number of patients needed to get a specified level of accuracy by 25 to 50 percent, which is quite substantial. And um, I don't have a number for dynamic allocation, but um, I should try to find one because I think, you know, my, my intuition tells me that if we can keep the total imbalance very low, we're making the um, groups of patients uh, to which each treatment is applied, the groups are going to be very similar, more similar than if we um, use the uh, traditional methods uh, complete randomization or permuted blocks. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry I don't have a number, but um, I, uh, I think it's certainly very much worth exploring, put it that way. Okay, and and an, increasing, yeah, an increasing fraction of clinical trials are um, being, uh, are, are moving over to dynamic allocation as people wake up to the fact that it's there. And my hope is that for some folks in the audience today, um, this may be uh, a new tool uh, for their toolkit kit that they hadn't been aware of, um, but it, uh, it definitely uh, is highly worth considering.